Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're starting right on time. Um, anyway, thank you all for, for being here at this, at this forum on the intersection of domestic violence and firearms. I'm really excited to see so many advocates and law enforcement officers and, and government colleagues here today. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, we're here to commemorate both the Domestic Violence Awareness Month and the first National Community Policing Week. We use these observations to recognize the progress that we've made while recommitting our, ourselves to improving our efforts to prevent violence and improve public safety in communities all across the country. As we all know, domestic violence continues to endanger millions of women, men, children, and families every year. In fact, every minute, 20 people in the, in the United States are victims of physical violence by an intimate partner. And one in three women and one in 10 men, or 45 million adults, experience physical violence, rape, or stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lives. And I know that for all of us, that these numbers are unacceptable for a nation that's committed to eradicating domestic abuse. And coupled with these statistics, there are examples in the news every day of the devastating toll that gun violence takes on our communities. And while it might be less obvious from the headlines, the overlap of these two observances and these two social problems is significant. The correlation between the presence of guns and domestic violence is staggering. Research conducted by our colleagues at Johns Hopkins found that the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide for women by 500%. So it's by 500% that if there's a gun in the, in the home, that increases the risk by 500%. In 2013, 895 women in the United States were killed by a husband, a boyfriend, or an ex-husband, and more than half of these killings were uh, murders involved guns. 72% of murder suicides involve an intimate partner, and Every Town for Gun Safety reports that the real target for 57% for of mass shootings is a current or former intimate partner or family member. These are harrowing statistics that represent the lives of real people. But we do have solutions. There are federal and state laws and other strategies that can prevent these tragedies, but laws need to be, to be enforced and strategies must be implemented and studied. So we're here today to raise awareness, to promote promising practices, and learn from each other to discover new solutions to address the intersection of domestic violence and firearms. Today, we'll hear from a panel of experts who are dedicated to finding and using these solutions in communities all across the country. I hope that their presentations, as well as our discussions here today, can help inform all of us and our communities on ways we, th we can work together to reduce gun violence and domestic abuse by focusing on where these issues converge. We're also launching a new website today, and that will take the shape of a national resource center, which will provide up-to-date information and model strategies for communities and it will be a resource that will last long after this week and long after this month are over. Stopping domestic abuse and ending gun violence are pieces of the same mission. So thank you all again for being here today and for being part of the solution. I'd now like you to join me in welcoming a key partner and a driving force for change, positive change, here at the Department of Justice, the Honorable Sally Q. Yates, who's the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Well, B, thank you for your introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your truly outstanding leadership of the Office of Violence Against Women. You do an unbelievable job. And Ruth, the Executive Director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, thank you for being here today, what you do every day, and also for being willing to share your story with us today. Now, as B said, we're gathering to here today during Domestic Violence Awareness Month to, to stand with survivors and to recognize the progress that we've made, but much more importantly, to recommit ourselves to the work ahead, to, to build a country where nobody suffers from the horrors of domestic violence. You know, the statistics that B just cited are really startling. I mean, if you let them wash over you and, and kind of sink in, absolutely startling, but behind every one of those numbers is a person. 
a person whose life was devastated by domestic violence. And we know that the intersection of domestic violence and firearms is a particularly deadly combination. As B said, you know, increasing the, the likelihood of a homicide by 500% just with the presence of a firearm in the home. So we know that when abusers have access to firearms, it presents not just a risk to the victims, but to other family members, to bystanders, to everyone who can end up being in harm's way. So what do we do about it? Well, we know that the federal laws that we have, our federal firearms laws, are designed to keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers and designed in two ways. One, if you're convicted of a crime, and you all know this, I don't need to be telling you this, you're the experts, but you know, if you're convicted of a crime of domestic violence, even a misdemeanor conviction, you're prohibited from owning a firearm. Or if you have a protective order entered against you because of an act of domestic violence. And as a consequence of that, over the last 18 years, those background checks that are done through the FBI NICS system have kept 126,000 would-be gun buyers who were convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence crimes, it's prevented 126,000 of them from being able to get a gun. And 53,000 would-be gun buyers who were subject to domestic violence restraining orders were not able to get a firearm. So those statistics B was citing would be even worse, but for that. But we know that the NICS system is only as good as the information that is input into the NICS system. And so that's why earlier this year in January, DOJ reached out to all of the states to lay out for them how critically important it is that they submit all relevant information to the NICS system and particularly highlighting domestic violence information. The Attorney General sent a letter to every single governor in the state laying out why this is important and what we needed them to do to redouble their efforts. And we need to keep the pressure up on the states to be really vigilant about the information that they're inputting into the NICS system so that we can keep guns out of the hands of, of domestic abusers. What else can we do? Well, you know, I'll acknowledge to you that the prosecution of domestic violence cases it's for the most part something that is handled by our state and local colleagues, our state and local prosecutors. But that doesn't mean that there's not a role for the Department of Justice to be playing and a role that we are playing in this. For example, earlier this year, we reached out again to all of our U.S. attorneys, the Department of Justice that's out in the field, to, to ask them to redouble their efforts to prevent prohibited persons from acquiring firearms, including those who had domestic violence prohibitors. And last year, as you all probably know, OVW issued some really important guidance to law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, and how to respond to sexual assault cases because we know what an impact that bias, explicit or, or usually more commonly implicit bias can have when investigators are, are investigating a domestic violence case, how that implicit bias can impact how they respond to those sexual assault cases. And as a result of that, it can, it can result in misclassifying or under-reporting those cases. And when that happens, that individual is not prohibited from being able to get a firearm, and so that the, the violence cycle continues there. OVW's guidance is really clear and encourages law enforcement agencies to set out very specific policies and practices for how they will handle domestic violence and domestic se sexual abuse cases. And encourages these local law enforcement agencies to not only train in this, but to make sure that they are putting accountability procedures in place as well to ensure that law enforcement is following the policies that they lay out. We're also doing what we can with respect to funding. Um, it's just by way of one example, earlier this year we announced about $3.2 million in investments to try to help local communities prevent domestic violence homicides. I'm proud of the efforts that the department um, is directing in this area, but you know, there's a whole lot more to do, a lot more for all of us to be doing. And 
you all, many of you are the ones who are on the front lines of doing this. And so I want to thank you for what each and every one of you does every day in educating the public and helping victims and survivors of domestic violence and, and addressing and implementing important prevention measures um, to try to prevent our, our citizens from being victims of domestic violence to begin with. I think it's going to be a great forum today where you're going to be able to hear from real experts in the field, not just talking about domestic violence, but our topic today, the intersection of firearms with domestic violence. We're going to keep working on this here at the Department of Justice, both B and a whole lot of other folks who are very passionate on these issues. And we're going to continue to count on you and your partnership in doing that. Uh, I wish I was able, I'm going to be able to stay for a few minutes. I've got to run out to catch a flight to go to my son's parents weekend at college um, after this. So I, I can't be late for that. So I'm sorry that I can't stay with you for, for the balance of the afternoon. But I'm looking forward to hearing about what you all learn and the ideas that you had this afternoon and continuing to work with you in the future as well. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Deputy Attorney General Yates. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, uh, now I want to introduce Ru Ruth Glenn. Ruth, is a, as a Deputy Attorney General said, is the Executive Director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and has been a fierce advocate for many years in addressing the issues of, of domestic violence. Uh, she's a survivor, a thriver, uh, and, and a very important colleague. So Ruth, please come and join us. Good afternoon. Thank you, B, And thank you so much to the Department of Justice and the Office of Violence Against Women. Um, for those of you that know me and for those of you that don't, this is a very, very important topic to me. Um, so to have this kind of forum and talk about this issue specifically is fantastic, and I hope it won't be the last. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on because I cannot see. <laughs> I'm honored to be here today among my esteemed colleagues and all of you experts. I'm happy to be here, but it is also with a bit of melancholy. I'm disturbed and sad that we still have to have these conversations. It seems outdated, doesn't seem real. That we still have to discuss domestic violence. I readily acknowledge that we've made a lot of progress over the years, but not enough, and particularly about the specific issue. Even though I'm sad we're still having these discussions, I'm also very pleased to be standing here as a survivor of domestic violence and a survivor of gun violence and domestic violence. In 1992, I was left for dead by my then husband. I am pleased because he did, not, he did not intend for me to live after the three shots to my body. I know he didn't intend for me to live because for the 13 plus years that we were married, he made sure that I knew he and the guns had total control over me and that he could kill me in seconds. Guns were the tool. I want to be very clear about that. There were other me mechanisms, but guns were the tool that he used to maintain and keep control over me. Though there were other forms of physical and emotional violence, the gun represented so much more. It was more potent than hands and words. He kept the gun on the refrigerator as a reminder of that control. On at least two occasions in the early part of our marriage, it was pulled on me to remind me of its power and his. I was aware that with the ease of a trigger pull that I could be dead. It was absolutely terrifying on many occasions. When he shot me, he had, I had been gone for almost eight months. I want to be very clear about that. I was already gone. I had left. Over the years, I had begun to eventually understand what was happening. I began to understand that the berating and the battery were not a normal way of life. And frankly, at the time, I also did it for my son's sake. I began to watch the impact that it was having on him, the violence. The catalyst for me understanding that danger even more was the day that it, this, the gun was used to instill further fear and exert control over my son. On this particular day, I left work in a frenzy because the school had called us each individually to let us know that my son was in trouble. He was 13 at the time and his grades were failing. I knew that my husband would be raging and that if I did not get there in time, my son could be hurt or even worse. I entered the house at the moment that he was leveling the gun at David. As I tried to intervene, the firearm was turned on me 
And as he held, turned around, he held the gun on me and told my, held the gun on me and told my son that if he brought any more bad grades in the home, that I would be killed. That solidified for me what I was already contemplating, leaving. We snuck away, and I refused to let anybody know where we were going or to help us, and I think you all understand why. Well, he found us, as he said he always would, just days later, and began a harassment and stalking campaign. Just a few weeks later, he used that very same gun to kidnap me at gunpoint. He held me for four hours. During that time, he begged me to kill him. He threatened to kill himself and threatened to kill both of us. He bonded out. He was caught. I was able to get away. He was caught. He bonded out of jail, and I got my first protection order. Again, a few weeks later, he found me, as he always said he would. He always said he would find me, and he lived that out and continued to stalk me. Somehow, he was able to acquire another firearm and shot me, as he frequently said he would. My son was spared, and I'll never know why, but my husband went on the run. Four minutes later, he was found and turned the gun on himself and committed suicide. That was also a very sad day. We all know that this is not an uncommon story. These scenarios are played out, the stalking, the shootings, every day in this nation for other survivors. That's why I tell my story, because I lived. I distinctly remember one of my early activities was participating in a survivor's group. It was then that I realized that I was not the only one who had endured domestic violence, and surprisingly, not the only one who had endured gun violence with, in the combination with domestic violence. Since that time, I've been privileged because I'm alive and driven to work and volunteer in domestic violence. So, when I tell my story, I'm often questioned. Why didn't I ever take the gun? Why didn't I use the gun against him? And why didn't I get a gun? For those that don't understand the dynamics of domestic violence, that makes perfect sense. It seems so logical, but it's not. The fear is the truth. The truth is the gun's presence when there is domestic violence can be dangerous for everyone, not just the perpetrator and not just the victim. The idea that a victim should remove a firearm is an idea that has no grounding in the reality of these situations, nor is the idea that a victim should arm themselves to prevent domestic violence. When we're talking about domestic violence and gun violence in that intersection, as we often talk about the lethality and the murders that occur, we must also address the fact that guns are used in powerful tools in so many other ways in domestic violence. There's nothing more frightening than knowing that there's a gun in the home when you're a victim of domestic violence. We all know that those, abuse, those who abuse and have access to weapons are five to eight times more likely to kill their intimate partners in a domestic violence situation than those without firearms. I'm citing stats that have already been cited, but they're important to remember. It is my hope and, in fact, my intention that as long as I can speak up as a survivor and speak out as an advocate and do what I can to limit access, remove firearms from those who commit dom domestic violence, I will. I will do that to ensure that all who intervene on behalf of victims and survivors understand the ways in which guns make victims more susceptible to violence and death. As a nation, we must do something that provides safety and supports for victims who are subject to domestic violence and vi involving firearms. We must promote policies and practices nationwide that support victims and provide protections from gun violence. For those who engage in the conversation about gun rights, they quite often lose sight of the rights of victims and those impacted by gun violence in the context of domestic violence. We intend to do all that we can to ensure that these victims are never lost in those conversations. You and I know that the threat of guns when domestic violence is present is real. You and I know that the threat to entire families and communities when there's an intersection of domestic violence and firearms is real. We must work to help others understand and be motivated to assist in making change. I and the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence is committed to working with our allies, 
participating in dialogue and do what we can to educate and help change laws and practices that allow for the scourge to, scourge to exist. We will continue to fight for policies and guidelines that ensure victims are heard and abusers are held accountable, and we will have made it safer for victims, families, and communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for your courage. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for being here and your constant commitment to um, using your story and using um, your life to make so much positive impact in so many other people's lives. So thank you so much. So please join me in thanking Ruth one more time. I think it's important that we talk about, you know, we talk about the individuals and talk about, you know, what the impact of this work is that, that we do. And for those of us that are professionals in the field, you know, um, connecting to people's lives is, is, is always important to do all the time. Um, and I'm thrilled to be uh, that we're joined by a panel of incredible experts and with incredible amount of passion. Um, we've got uh, one, two, three, five, seven people, I think. So we've got a, a big panel of folks that are coming up to talk. So uh, I want to introduce Darren Mitchell, who's here somewhere, um, uh, who's, who's a longtime colleague of, of ours, uh, who's been a consultant with, with OVW and others for, for, I think, at least 16 years, um, looking at the issue of uh, intersection of domestic violence and firearms and child custody and a million other things. And uh, and uh, Darren will be introducing the panel and bringing them up. So, Darren. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just so inspired and thrilled to share a stage with, with you, Ruth, and, and with you, B as well. Um, I, it's really, it's amazing to hear your story and, to, and thank you for so powerfully showing us why, why we're doing this work, why it's important for us as professionals, um, advocates and others, and also for us as a nation to do better. Um, and do more to protect victims, children's, uh, children, and others. Um, this too far, too close. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use glasses as well. So I, I also, I, I really, I must thank the U.S. Department of Justice and the Office on Violence Against Women. I've been, as as B said, I've been doing this for about 16 years. That I and there's several other people in the room who I've worked with for that long on this issue as well. And your your support. For this work has just been unwaveringly uh, unwavering and incredibly strong for a very long time so thank you um it's my pleasure also i'll be introducing the panel in just a few minutes and i have a very strong temptation to just step aside and let them talk because as you know we've assembled really the greatest thinkers on this issue both researchers people who've worked in the field um in a professional way um and others who have a, a lot of very um important things to share with us all. But we all agreed as a group that before we did that, we would spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, the legal landscape that all this work is taking place in. Because a after all, we're here to talk about implementation of the existing laws. We want to make sure that everyone has a good sense of, of, what, these, of what these laws are. And you saw from, if you look at the uh, cover of our program, our theme today is safer families and safer communities. And I think all three of you really shared how important it is to be thinking about the survivors, thinking about the children of survivors, but also the others who are impacted by, by gun violence, the first responders, the interveners, the bystanders. Um, and so that's why we're talking about families and broader communities. And we also have a particular focus on what folks can do at the community level. We're not talking abstractly about application of the federal law and how you interpret the various provisions of the federal law. We're talking about how folks from all the important disciplines and the public can help make their community safer for families, uh, for, for children, and for others. So um, with that, I will start, it looks like this is going to work great, um, a very brief overview of, the, of these laws. We could, of course, spend the next three hours talking about them. I promise we won't. There are several people in this room who could easily spot and speak for three hours very intelligently about them. I'm not that person. We're going to jump right into it. On the federal side of things, we're going to take a very brief look at two important laws, sets of laws um, that are on the books. One is under the gun con Federal Gun Control Act. The other is the Brady Handgun Pre Violence Prevention Act, or the Brady Act, which prevents purchases of firearms by people who are prohibited. The Gun Control Act um, it was was developed and it, it was passed in 1968. It's a law that classifies several groups of so-called prohibited persons because of their status, mostly because of crimes they committed or have been um, convicted of or have been accused of, cannot have access to, to firearms or ammunition. In 1994, when the Vi Violence Against Women Act was passed, that law was expanded to include, for the first time, folks who are subject to, um, to protection orders, 
both civil and criminal protection orders um, that meet certain qualifi qualifying um, characteristics, which we'll talk about in just a second. In 1996, one of our great leaders in this area, Frank Lautenberg, a senator, um, introduced the Lautenberg Amendment, which was passed um, by Congress to expand this list of prohibited persons to include, for the first time, misdemeanors, people convicted of misdemeanor crimes, um, specifically crimes of domestic violence, which we'll talk about in a moment as well. These are both found in the, uh, in the um, United States Code, Criminal Code section. In addition, we like to point out, there are provisions that prohib prohibit people, that criminalize the transfer or the sale um, of firearms to people who are so prohibited if they do so in a knowing fashion. So first, let's look at what we sometimes call 922G8. It's the civil protection or the protection order um, uh, step part of the statute. It prohibits what I said were qualifying protection orders. The law doesn't call them qualifying, but it does set forth a series of requirements that must be met in order for those orders to, um, to bring this federal law to bear on a particular person. I'm not going to go through the details on it, but there's due process protections. The order has to have been uh, issued after hearing or an opportunity to be heard. What does that mean? What kind of orders are excluded? Ex parte orders. If both parties aren't present at the hearing, or at least there's not an, uh, a hearing available at which the person can participate, this federal law does not include those types of orders. In addition to that, there's a relationship requirement, um, intimate partners, children of the abuser, um, and a couple of other things that I won't go into any detail on. But there also, this law was very cleverly written, knowing that many protection orders, especially in the civil arena, are issued um, based on consent of the parties, upon agreement of the parties, and sometimes, many times, judges don't make specific findings that abuse has taken place. And so the law says there either needs to be a finding that the defendant poses a credible threat um, to the physical safety of the uh, petitioner, or, if there is no such finding, that it prohibits certain conduct. And so, what does this mean? Consent orders. Virtually all the consent orders across the country, or orders entered by agreement, are uh, covered by this federal law. And such a, a respondent to such an order is going to be in violation of it if he, if he possesses a, a weapon. The Lautenberg Amendment, as we mentioned earlier a couple times now, the misdemeanor crime part of this law, it is a, um, it is a statute that covers certain misdemeanor crimes that can be tribal, state, or federal misdemeanors that have certain characteristics, and I've listed them here. The elements are that either there has to have been the use or the threatened use of physical force in the, as one of the elements of the crime, or there has to have been a threatened use of a deadly weapon as part of the crime. Many states have revised their statutes to ensure that these crimes are covered by the federal um, domestic violence firearms statute. In addition, there's a relationship requirement. You'll see it's very long. It's very complicated. Um, some cases get down to, did the respondent have his toothbrush at the victim's house so that they were similarly situated to spouses? We're not going to go into all those details, just to say that there is a relationship requirement. It is supposed to be about domestic violence, intimate partner violence. Um, if, you are subject, if you have been convicted of one of these crimes, for your lifetime, you are now prohibited under federal law from purchasing or possessing weapons, um, unless you get it expunged, um, which is available in some states. That's the federal law. Uh, that's, the, that's the prohibition on um, possession and purchase. The Brady Act stops purchases. It's a law that was enacted to enable licensed dealers of firearms to conduct background checks through the FBI and, and um, de the Deputy uh, Attorney General um, mentioned the NICS system, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, that does this check. If you're subject to a state or federal prohibitor, you can't buy your gun. And we know that's a very effective system for licensed dealers. For, for situations in which the background check is actually conducted. And a lot of the strategies we talk with about communities is how you get the information to the people who need to have it in order to make those prohibitions on purchases. Now, what about on the state and tribal side of things? Many, many states and tribes have similar, yet different laws on the books around these issues. Some of them are actually more uh, or broader in coverage than the federal law. Plus, they have specific directives to courts, to law enforcement officers, over how they should be responding in situations where there are firearms and domestic violence cases. So we're going to look at a couple of these, civil protection order, some related statutes, misdemeanor crime, uh, DV crime statutes, and law enforcement authority statutes. Just a brief overview. I'm going to start with some tribal law. Um, folks uh, should understand that many of the tribes around the country have enacted 
powerful laws on this issue. I have just a few listed here, the Tulela tribe, Nez Perce, uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, uh, Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, um, Hoopa Valley tribe, and Sitka tribe in Alaska, all have enacted statutes that allow judges to order dispossession of guns or surrender of guns, that have automatic prohibitions that kick in when an order of protection is issued against you, as the federal law does. So there are tools in the toolkit for folks in Indian country to disarm uh, abusers and protect victims, children and, children and other people. I'm gonna um, just briefly go through these maps. I wanted to give you a sense because one of our pre presenters, Dr. Uh, April Zioli, is gonna talk in a little more detail about implementation of state laws. But just so you get a sense, around the country, there are many states that have included explicit statutes that have explicit court authority to prohibit possession or purchase of guns when a civil protection order has been issued. There's also what we sometimes call implicit authority. Many of you are familiar with catch-all provisions in protection order statutes that the court can issue relief, other relief, not otherwise enumerated in the statute to protect the victim and children in these cases. There are some places, Oregon and Kentucky are two that stand out, where they've used that implicit authority to develop very robust systems to disarm abusers who have had civil protection orders issued against them. There are fewer courts that have specific authority for judges to order surrender of guns, as opposed to you can't possess guns, you can't purchase guns. In these states, it's either discretionary on the part of the judge or mandatory in some states. The court can say you shall surrender your weapons to X law enforcement agency by X time. Very powerful laws that we're working on helping uh, with implementation of in many different ways. Misdemeanor crimes are also covered by several state laws. Not very many, but, but a few have laws that mi mostly mirror um, the federal law. And finally, I mentioned the law enforcement response. There's a handful of states that have specifically given authorized law enforcement officers to either on a discretionary basis or on a mandatory basis take guns at the scene of a domestic violence crime. Now, as I think um, Dave Thomas will talk about in a few minutes, there are lots of sources of authority to do that in a particular situation. It doesn't necessarily have to be explicit in your law in this way. But just to give you a sense that there are some places where legislators have decided that they want to give law enforcement officers those powers. So this is our background on, uh, on the legal landscape around uh, domestic violence and firearms. I'm now going to introduce the panel, and I think we're going to have them all come up at once, um, please. And I'll introduce you one at a time as you come up to speak. So our panel is amazing. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, introduce them by reading their bios. You have their bios in, um, in, your, in the handout that was on your, on your chair. I'm just gonna say a couple of words for each of them. And the first, our first panelist is um, Dr. Jacqueline Campbell. So before you get seated, <laughs> Jack, you may wanna head on up here, thank you. And Dr. Campbell almost doesn't need any sort of introduction to the folks in this room. Um, as, as pretty much I'm sure all of you know, she is our preeminent thinker and researcher on lethality. She's a developer of the danger assessment tool, which is used in internationally. She just came back from Sri Lanka uh, to, talk about, to, to talk about her work. And we can think of no one better to, to talk about the public health imperative to the work that we're doing. So I introduce you to Dr. Jacqueline Campbell. Don't touch it. Do not touch my... I am delighted to be here. Um, I have indeed done a lot of research on this issue for a very long time. I remember very well the first VAWA Act, um, the work that many of us did in this room on the Brady Bill and supporting it and how important that was. So as has been mentioned, um, when women are killed in this country, the majority are killed by a husband, boyfriend, or ex-husband, ex-boyfriend. And that's nine times the rate that are killed by strangers. Um, and that's one of the things oftentimes the public is not really aware of. And five to 8% of men are killed by intimate partners. 54% of that domestic violence homicide is committed with guns. Uh, when women are killed uh, by a partner, about 70% of them have been physically abused by that partner before they were killed. If a male is killed by a partner, about 75% of those cases was also preceded by domestic violence against the female. 
and importantly has has been mentioned by B that women are far more likely to be the victims of homicide suicide by a partner it's about 29% of the domestic violence homicides of a woman of a woman are followed by the suicide of the male partner and 88 to 94 percent of those homicide suicides are done with guns and when children are killed in domestic violence homicide incidents um, it's even higher that there's a proportion that are with guns um, a couple of these graphics are from every town um, they um, did some graphics for me when I testified before a Senate subcommittee on one of these laws to strengthen our federal laws on uh, guns with protective orders. So again, who shoots women? More than half are killed by intimate partners or family members. When women are killed by intimate partners, more than half are killed with guns. Um, and one of the important things to think about in terms of policy one of the things that has happened over time, one of the good news stories, is that we in this country have decreased domestic violence homicides. And a lot of that decrease, in fact, the majority of that decrease, has been related to gun removal or denial of possession of guns by known domestic violence offenders, as we talked about with the laws. Whoops. Um, I wanted to briefly mention the research the uh, national 11 city and one rural area femicide study, when we were trying to determine what were the risk factors over and above prior domestic violence, we knew prior domestic violence was the number one risk factor for domestic violence homicide. But it was which abused women were most at risk and what were the factors that put them at risk. Um, and this was funded by the original VAWA funding um, this research. Um, it's been published. There's several studies about it, American Journal of Public Health in 2003. Amongst the women who were killed, and this was a case controlled study, so we looked at women who were killed by an intimate partner in comparison to women who were abused by an intimate partner in those same cities. 65% of the domestic violence femicides, the abuser had a firearm owned a firearm. Now, he may not have had official registration papers for that firearm, but he felt like it was his. The abuse controls 24%. Um, as Ruth so eloquently talked about, in terms of previously used or threatened the victim with a, with a weapon before she was killed, 55% of the femicides versus only 5% of the other abused women. Firearm used in the most serious incident, 38% of the femicides, only 1% of the abused women. And this is data in terms of, as Ruth also mentioned, um, the victim owning a gun. And in this chart, the actual femicides, the victims are in, um, and perpetrators are in red. Uh, the attempted femicide victims are in blue. The yellow is abused. Um, uh, victims and offenders in those same cities and the purple is not abused women and um, offenders um, or partners in those same cities. So the victim basically owning a gun neither increased nor decreased her risk. 74% of the men that actually killed their partners said they owned a gun or their partner said they did or a proxy. 53% of the women who were almost killed, their partners owned a gun. 27% of abusive men in those same cities were gun owners. And 13% of non-abusive men in those same cities with a random sample um, population-based um, group of, of people were gun owners. So being, if you're abusive, twice as many abusers own guns four times as many men who almost kill their partners own guns, and six times as many men who killed them. And this is a busy slide, bottom line, about 30, um, a third of the cases of both actual and attempted femicide, those offenders should not have had that gun under existing laws 
in those communities. So that's a matter of failing to implement the laws we have. Uh, we did fancy um, multivariate logistic regression, which I can talk about, but I won't. Um, the perpetrator gun ownership, this is the data that was talked about in terms of 500% more likely to um, be killed than other abused women in those same cities. Um, showing it graphically, um, this is the uh, adjusted odds ratios here. Um, again, we looked at what happened at the time of the incident. Um, if a gun was used, the uh, woman was 24 times likely, more likely to die than, again, this is in comparison to abused women in the same cities. Homicide suicides, partner gun ownership was even a stronger risk factor um, than without suicide. And briefly, one of the implementation projects, one of the important um, homicide prevention projects that is being done in, the, in our communities is the LAP, which is a short form of the danger assessment, which um, police officers use at the scene of a domestic violence incident. They use it in order to inform women if they're at high risk to be killed, but also to get those women at high risk in immediate voice-to-voice um, -voice contact over the phone with domestic violence service providers, our very important first line of defense. Um, and so we evaluated this in Oklahoma. Um, it was um, funded by the National Institute of Justice. It was a quasi-experimental um, evaluation. Just bottom line, brief snapshot, and this has also been published, was that using the LAP, the women who actually talked to domestic violence advocates at the scene were in follow-up less likely to be frequently and severely abused. Um, so that's that intervention group. The other thing that's very important in terms of guns is one of the major protective actions that was used by women and significantly more of them used this when they were informed that gun ownership was an important risk factor by use of the LAP, actually removed or hid their partner's weapons. Now, as Ruth so eloquently talked about, it is almost impossible for women to do that safely. But these women managed to do that. And my point here is they shouldn't have had to do that themselves. They should have had legal ways to get that gun removed without them having to do it by themselves, which may have been terribly unsafe. Bottom line here is a quote from one of the women um, in the original femicide study, one of the moms that I interviewed, and she said, if you're going to talk about my daughter, you have to say this. Uh, Dave Keck, Commissioner Dave Keck from um, Wisconsin. And uh, for those of you who knew Barbara Hart, who, I, who was my supervisor and mentor for many years, she talked about keepers. Dave Keck is a huge keeper. He's a powerhouse. Um, he, he's passionate about this issue. He's effective on the ground all across the state. He's here to share the amazing work they've done in Wisconsin uh, on disarming abusers in, in civil protection order cases and the collaboration and multidisciplinary effort that's needed to succeed. Thank you, Darren. Uh, I'm here to talk about Wisconsin's SAFE Act and I'll tell you uh, really what that is about, but mostly I don't have statistics here. I'm here really to talk to you about my own, my own experience and our experience with developing uh, a protocol for firearm surrender and, and compliance with a firearm surrender order. So what I'm going to start us off with is the problem itself. Uh, for over 20 years, uh, Wisconsin statutes required courts to order uh, respondents to surrender firearms when there's an injunction granted uh, in domestic abuse. Uh, the terms I'm using are injunction and restraining order. We have that two-part system I think that every, every state has for uh, injunctions. In Wisconsin, they have a, uh, actually four different types of restraining order or injunction. There's the uh, domestic abuse, harassment, uh, vulnerable adult, and 
child abuse. The temporary restraining order, the TRO we call it, that's granted ex parte. That's uh, given out uh, with a 14-day limit. That's why it's a temporary restraining order. There just has to be probable cause to believe that there's grounds for it. That is then served on a respondent. And then there's the, the uh, injunction hearing, which is held 14 days later. And that's the, the due process hearing where the respondent has, a, has the right to appear and uh, contest or, or go along with the injunction. Uh, for over 20 years, the statute was not followed. And that's the problem that we had. And I, as a court commissioner, I'm now retired, but as a court commissioner, uh, it always bothered me that we were basically handing out, a, a uh, at the time of the injunction, we were handing out a, uh, a warning to the respondents that they couldn't possess a firearm, but we weren't really ordering anybody to surrender firearms like we were supposed to be doing. It was the same form that they use in felonies when in Wisconsin, it's a, it's a, uh, if there's a felony conviction, there's also a, an order that goes out to the defendant saying you can't possess any firearms. The problem that we had in Wisconsin is nobody knew really how to require surrender. Uh, we were supposed to be doing it. We were, our orders were supposed to re require that, but we didn't really know how to do that. It was uh, more a matter of the logistics of doing that. Uh, four counties, ours was one Winnebago County. There were four counties that were uh, given a, a grant from uh, VAWA grant to pilot different ways of, of looking to do this. Uh, two of the counties were, uh, were all adjoining counties. Two of them had uh, sheriff's departments, uh, putting together their, their programs. Uh, one had a, the district attorney's office. In our county, I was the one who was, uh, I guess, interested in doing this. So uh, I wanted to do it. I, I, it, had been, it had been something I'd wanted to do for a long time. But our approach ended up being one that was more court-centered uh, uh, than, than the others. Uh, and I think that was a lot of advantages to us doing it that way, because really, what the, the, the project was designed to do is set up a, uh, a system or a protocol for courts to, to do this. And it, it helped having me be the one that was, that was uh, piloting it. So uh, I won't go into too much detail about how to, how, what we did, but uh, the court, the clerk of courts, sheriff's department and domestic abuse shelter uh, in Winnebago County, those were the four biggest players in this. And I think in retrospect, I think that's, those are the, the most important ones. And I think you have to have all four of those. The domestic abuse shelter, obviously that's who not only uh, brings people in requesting these, these types of, of orders, but also is educating the, 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 the public about, uh, about the, the possibility of having a firearm surrender and also the reality of firearm surrender. Because uh, as we were going to learn that sometimes, uh, that sometimes deterred people from requesting uh, a restraining order in the first place, the fact that our county was going to be following through. Sheriff's Department is who actually uh, seizes the firearms, uh, collects the firearms, and enforces the, the, the violations of, this, of these orders. Clerk of Courts is important for scheduling the hearings and setting up the paperwork. And the court, I, I think, uh, needs to be involved at least with this type of protocol because it's really the court that's that's putting the issue of firearms out there for everyone to see and and uh, puts it in the forefront and 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 has to uh, sort of set the tone that it's going to be followed. Uh, the system was set up and we we coordinated between the four players. Um, we started the protocol and without going into too much detail, the protocol was fairly simple and it still is being used and it's still very fairly simple. At the time the temporary restraining order is, is granted, that uh, petitioner takes that out to the Sheriff's Department to be served on the respondent. And that includes a statement right in there saying, if this gets granted, you're going to have to surrender your firearms. And you're going to have to identify your firearms. There's a form that we had for respondents to fill out, identifying uh, how many firearms you have, what, where, what type of firearms, where they are. In Wisconsin, that's a big question because a lot of people have these uh, cabins in the north woods uh, of Wisconsin, and that's where a lot of times they keep their firearms. Uh, and uh, 
So they have to also say where they are, and that becomes important uh, if there's a dispute about firearms because uh, we also have a, a process for sending the sheriff's department out to find the firearms and get a search warrant if they're, if they're not turned in. That's the first part, the notice. Uh, the second part is the, is the form that has to be filled out. And then what we did in our county, just to, I guess, just to streamline it and make it simple, is we had something that I call a compliance hearing. So the day of the, of the injunction, if, for example, we had an injunction hearing on a Wednesday morning at, at 810, I would schedule a compliance hearing for the following week. It was just seven days. You have seven days uh, to come back here and either you're going to fill out the form that says you don't have any firearms and haven't had any firearms or you're going to identify your firearms and surrender the firearms or uh, which we found out was frequently the case is the respondent doesn't come to the, re the injunction hearing at all but he shows up the following week because he's concerned about his firearms being surrendered. So it was sort of a uh, compliance hearing, I called it. It was sort of a catch-all hearing for all of those different purposes. And uh, there's also something unique. I don't know if it's unique to, to Wisconsin, but it, there's when they created the statute on firearms surrender and restraining orders, they also put in something for third-party surrender, which was really set out there for all those years and nobody really used it. We actually did a number of third-party surrender hearings and we we came up with a with a protocol for that where what we would do is you if you uh were at the hearing and you had firearms and you wanted to give them to your sister or to your parents usually it was parents or, or uh parents or a sibling were most commonly who took the firearms we would make that person come in and put them on the record swear them in and warn them because the statute says you're supposed to and in wisconsin you warn them about the uh, consequences of turning a firearm over to uh, somebody who has a who has the injunction and it's a felony in in Wisconsin to do that warn them about civil liability and and ask them about whether or not they had any kind of uh, restrictions on firearms uh, and in case certain cases where there's a finding that the person was an appropriate person we would give them a firearms this is probably the most controversial part of this uh, I think when when we started to talk about it afterwards I think a lot of the domestic abuse shelters around the state of Wisconsin were skeptical that this would work, but my experience was it actually was useful for a, for, for a very specific reason, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, the uh, protocol, we, we started it out right about as soon as we got the, we got the okay to go ahead with the grant, um, and we started implementing it. There were some problems that we that we identified along the way uh, but those were mostly logistical problems and they were for the most part fairly simple uh, I think the probably the the one that stands out the most is simply how do you go about surrendering firearms when when you order somebody turn in your guns you've got to do that um, we would I just had the sheriff's uh, evidence coordinator I just had her her business cards in the in the courtroom and I would just give them a card and say this is the person you call call her up she'll give you a time and a place where you need to turn those firearms in and, and it would be done now what we always did was whether or not a third party was going to hold the firearms or not the other thing we 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 came up with along the way was the firearms go to the sheriff's department and the sheriff's department takes them takes them in and and, and logs them in and, and locks them up if your sister's going to come in next week and take the firearms that's fine but we're going to have the hearing first and we're going to approve that person first and we're going to also the sheriff's department is going to run a background check to see if that person can have the firearms back if there's anything that goes wrong if you if that person isn't approved the firearms stay locked up uh it, it ended up being a i think a streamlined approach and a, and a fairly simple one i think for that reason it we didn't really uh, have a lot of problems with that there were sometimes problems with other counties and sometimes even out of state but uh Mostly, we just were able to work through those, and it's just a matter of thinking through the logistics. And I think this is the biggest, the the biggest lesson in all of this is it's the details, uh, and knowing as a court, knowing that if you order somebody to do something, someone's going to follow through and make sure you do that. Uh, the other thing that I think happened a lot, well, it happened at times where uh, the respondent would come in at the compliance hearing and say, "I don't have any guns." And the petitioner would say, yes, he does. He does have guns, and I know where they are. 
we would our, our sheriff's department we always have a deputy in the courtroom um, they knew to pick up on that and they knew that that was at least at least probably probable cause to believe that that person was was committing a felony uh, he says he doesn't have firearms there, you know there's an order that says he can't and someone in the public at least is telling you that there is a felony being committed so they would know to follow up and and usually they would follow up with uh, either uh, investigation by by uh, further talking to that to that respondent or also getting a search warrant to go out and look for the firearms uh, the protocol that we used we as I said with a few refinements ultimately became the framework for the for the proposed safe act um, which ended up becoming state law that the uh, courts in the state of Wisconsin have to follow through and basically set a compliance hearing notify the respondents and make them fill out the form and turn that back in there were some uh, 11th hour objections from a, a specific uh, group that uh, was threatening to block the legislative uh, action here to to put this through and actually um, what ended up having and there were some compromises made so that it was that it was um, ultimately passed and it's interesting because uh, Darren talked about the federal law here for uh, possession of a firearm when there's an injunction without or an injunction has been put in place by the state that the respondent has had an opportunity to be heard and notice of the hearing and that's important because uh, the uh, framework here that we put together for surrendering firearms if you looked at that together with the federal law you would see that there were problems because if once the injunction is granted if you tell somebody to go up to their cabin and get their guns and bring them down they could be potentially violating the federal law because they would be driving in the car with a gun and they're not supposed to have that so the compromise that was worked out was ultimately to thank you to put the uh, the injunction stay the injunction for 48 hours or more sometimes and put a uh, uh, go back to the the temporary restraining order have the person surrender the firearm so they're not violating the state or the federal law I guess the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think it's important to talk to other groups that are opposing anything like this and and see if you can hear what their what their real objection is and uh, in our experience I think it actually improved it, our, our protocol because it actually ended up uh, making a taking care of a problem that was already there uh, time to stop sorry I still have unfinished business but I'll get to that maybe if I get another chance thank you thank you so much next up we have um, dr. April Zioli who is at Michigan State University she's a cutting-edge researcher looking at, among other things, the efficacy of these various interventions we've been talking about. And she's here to share some information I think that's very valuable to those of us who are working in the field, trying to discern which of the various interventions we're considering are the ones we should be pursuing. So by far the most researched of the domestic violence firearm specific interventions are those policies that require those who have uh, been put under domestic violence restraining orders it bans them from purchase or possession of firearms. Now, at the state level, these laws can be very different from the federal level. They can be broader, and many states include dating partners under their restrictions. Many states include ex parte orders under their restrictions. So three longitudinal studies of these state-level domestic violence restraining order gun prohibitions were done, and, and now actually a fourth that I just completed. And these longitudinal studies went from about 1980 to the early to mid-2000s, and now my recent one goes up to 2013. And they each looked at the impact of these laws on intimate partner homicide. And all of these studies are consistent in finding that when these laws are in place, there is an associated reduction in intimate partner homicide of about 7 to 19 percent, depending on when you're look, whether you're looking at the state level or at large cities within those states. And this is important because there is a hypothesis that when someone doesn't have a firearm but they want to kill, they want to kill their intimate partner, they're just going to find a different way to do it. They're going to use a knife, they're going to use bodily force, they're going to do it. 
If that hypothesis held, we would expect intimate partner homicide committed with firearms to go down, but total intimate partner homicide to stay the same. That's not what any of these, any of these studies found. They all found that total intimate partner homicide was reduced, suggesting that these laws may save lives. But these laws are very difficult to implement. The purchase prohibition is pretty straightforward. If you go to a federally licensed firearms dealer and you are restricted because of a domestic violence restraining order, the disqualified restraining order comes up during your background check and you are denied the sale. There are loopholes. You may be able to go to a private seller in the state, but if you're found through a background check to be restricted, you can't buy. If you possess a firearm already, we just heard an excellent talk uh, you know, about what happens if you already possess a firearm and, and are then restricted. If you possess a firearm already, generally not much happens. You often get to keep the firearm, but many jurisdictions and states are trying to figure out how better to implement these laws. Again, we just heard a you know, quite good speech on it, but in these states, the light green states and the dark green states have passed legislation suggesting how these are to be implemented. And what generally happens is that the person who is supposed to relinquish their firearm has to relinquish it to law enforcement or transfer it to a federally licensed firearm dealer or transfer it to a third party. And they have to do this within a certain amount of time. And if they transfer to a, a licensed firearm dealer or a third party, they have to bring an affidavit or a receipt to law enforcement. And again, they do it within 24 to 70, 72 hours. It depends on the state. If they don't do this, in some states, the court can order a, per, um, a search and seizure warrant, that's part of the statute, to get these firearms away from these people. Now. A demonstration project was completed in California that looked at the implementation of their law. And what they did was when they suspected or knew someone had a firearm and, were new, and was newly prohibited, when law enforcement served the, the restraining order, they would say, you were prohibited from firearm possession. You know, they told them about the prohibition, asked for the firearms right then and there, or, or told them to transfer it to a licensed dealer. And they were actually quite successful in getting firearms from people on the scene. And importantly, the risk of danger to law enforcement was not any greater than during the normal serving of a restraining order. So that's a model that may be able to be replicated in many states to continue to remove these firearms to better implement these firearm prohibitions. The last law I want to talk about is the state legislation on these misdemeanor violence convictions where you're prohibited from firearm purchase or possession due to the misdemeanor conviction. Now, most states uh, that have this follow the federal uh, model and only restrict for domestic violence. But some states, the states in green, have broader um, prohibitions where anybody convicted of violent misdemeanor, doesn't matter what the relationship is, is prohibited from purchase or possession. And the study I just completed found that when a state prohibits all violent misdemeanors from purchase and possession, there's about an 18% reduction associated with intimate partner homicide. But those studies that I told you about before that looked at the restraining order laws, none of them found an associated reduction when you're just focused on domestic violence. And that's probably because those laws are harder to implement. When these misdemeanor convictions go in the background system, the relationship information often doesn't come with them. So when you get that restriction, you don't, when you get that misdemeanor conviction, you don't know. The person doing the background check doesn't know. With all violent misdemeanors, they know they need to disqualify that person from purchase. Thank you very much. A couple times now where there's definite um, opportunities for improvement in information sharing and I know the department as a whole has been um, working hard on those on those issues as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, um, Elizabeth Avor from Every Town for Gun Safety. And uh, Ms. Avor and her colleagues at Every Town have been engaged in many, many different efforts to help communities respond better to this lethal threat we're talking about. And What's so wonderful about their work is they back it up with some very robust data collection and research efforts. So she's here to share what every town has learned about how we can best protect children and families um, in our communities. Thanks. Well, we've heard a lot of great evidence today that describes the link between domestic violence and gun violence and just how strong that link is. 
uh, both Dr. Campbell and Dr. Zioli have um, done research that's really shed a lot of light on how guns actually turn domestic violence situations into domestic homicide situations. Um, what every town has done is uh, taken a closer look at mass shootings in particular, and despite you know the way these shootings are portrayed by media, we found that most of them are actually um, related to domestic or family violence. Uh, so what we did is we took a uh, we conducted a comprehensive analysis of every mass shooting that was identifiable either through FBI data or through media reports from January 2009 to July 2015. And we found that in 57% of those shootings, the shooter actually killed a former or current spouse or um, an intimate partner or other family member. So, and actually when you look at that subset of the of mass shootings, those that were domestic violence or, um, or family violence related, actually over a quarter of those shooters had a prior domestic violence charge. Um, and you know, I should, I should have prefaced all this all by saying that mass shootings are a very small percentage of the gun violence that occurs in this country. It's actually under 1%, but it's kind of fascinating that even when you look at this subset, um, it is so closely correlated with domestic violence. And I think that really the, the closer you look at this issue, the more you, the clearer it becomes that our country's gun violence problem is really a, a domestic violence problem and that our domestic violence problem is absolutely a gun problem. The two are just very intimately linked. And, you know, as we uh, heard earlier, there are provisions in federal law that are designed to address this very problem by keeping guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. That's those um, prohibit prohibitors that are based on restraining orders and on misdemeanor crimes and domestic violence. And, of course, to be effective, though, these prohibitors need to be enforced. Um, and I kind of like to think of it as there are, there are two sides to this enforcement coin. Um, we need to keep these prohibited domestic abusers from buying new guns and we need to make sure that they get rid of those guns that they already have, that they don't hold on to guns that they had before they became prohibited. So the way we keep them from getting new guns is through these background check requirements, and um, federal law requires that um, a, a person pass a background check if they buy a gun from a gun store, from a licensed gun dealer, and there are actually 18 states that have gone beyond that and require background checks on all handgun sales, even if they're sold by unlicensed sellers, um, which evidence suggests uh, comprise about 40 percent of the of the gun market and then the way we prevent abusers from keeping the guns they already have is by requiring that they relinquish those guns as we've we've, we've heard um today um so when a final domestic violence restraining order is issued or when a misdemeanor crime of domestic uh violence conviction occurs um actually making sure that the the abuser is required to to, to give up his guns at that point uh, so every town recently did some research in Rhode Island that revealed just how rarely abusers in that state are ordered to turn in firearms in their possession, even when that restraining order makes them prohibited from owning firearms under federal law. So what we did is we took a look at all um, the publicly available final protective orders issued by Rhode Island courts in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Um, and when I say final domestic violence restraining orders, I'm talking about those that are issued after notice in a hearing, so not those at the ex parte stage. And what we found is that courts ordered abusers to turn in their guns in only 5% of those cases. And so keep in mind that the vast majority of these cases, about three quarters of them, um, met the criteria to be prohibiting under federal law. Um, but the judges were actually no more likely to order abusers who are prohibited by federal law to turn in their guns than abusers who weren't. So uh, that means that still just 5% of the abusers who are federally prohibited from having guns were actually ordered to turn in their guns at the time of um, the restraining orders were issued. And uh, just uh, quickly, the reason there are only, um, the, the, what's going on with the other quarter of those orders is they weren't prohibiting um, because the relationship criteria wasn't met. Typically because the uh, victim and abuser were non-cohabitating dating partners or, um, or else they had some other familial relationship like siblings then that weren't that didn't meet the criteria for federal law to be prohibiting. So as a result, what we found is that um, we took a, we actually took even a closer look and we, we saw that um, even when the written records surrounding these orders specifically indicated a firearm threat, uh, courts actually ordered abusers to turn in their guns in less than 13 percent of the cases. So more often, but still very infrequently. And what that meant is that as a result, 
325 abusers who appeared to have access to guns were actually not ordered to turn them in. And um, just this past May, we followed up on those 325 abusers who appeared to have access to guns, but uh, weren't, weren't uh, were ordered to turn them in. And um, we found that actually 25% uh, of them had another run-in with the law after that. So just to keep in mind the time frame here, uh, these orders were all issued in 2012, 2013, and 2014. For so, so for a quarter of these abusers to have a run-in with the law by by mid-2016 is actually pretty pretty astounding. Um, and I am out of time, <laughs> but um, so I'll just uh, I'll leave it with that. Next up is uh, Dave Thomas, who is a uh, someone that I've known for a very long time and I've admired for a very long time. And every time I talk to him about these issues, which I know he's been devoted to for many, many years, uh, I learned something new and I'm sure you will as well. He's here to share a law enforcement uh, officer's perspective on these issues. Thank you. Good afternoon. You know, I see the, the role of law enforcement in this as, as critical. I mean, we are... Uh, we are the condu a direct conduit between the community and the criminal justice system. And we have an opportunity to gain intel every single time we have one of these, an interaction. And when we, when we realize that roughly half of the women killed by their intimate partners had contact with the criminal justice system uh, to report violence and stalking within the year preceding the murders, that should tell us something. That should tell us if I had the opportunity to intervene. Did I do everything that I could do when I was there? You know, when, when, when women seek assistance from the criminal justice system, they create that opportunity for intervention. And, you know, the first responders especially have opportunities to disarm perpetrators if they're equipped with the proper knowledge. If they look at the situation in context, and if they have a depth of knowledge of this area of the law and of the, 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 the incident that they're investigating. You talk to individuals who investigate, uh, investigate drug-related crimes, man, they know all about it. I got two brothers who are motor officers. There is so much I don't care about pulling somebody over that they can tell you everything about it, right? We've got to get officers more involved in understanding that when I say domestic violence, I'm also talking about stalking. I'm also talking about sexual assault. I'm also talking about child abuse. So when any one of them comes up, I start thinking of all these safe, safety factors. We are challenged to ensure the safety of everyone involved, right? That means me going home safe too. And you know, in the last five years, 42 officers died intervening in domestics by firearm. And in a lot of these, we find the, the, the perpetrator also had sexual assault charges also was a stalker. And so the, the, that interconnected nature, when I understand that, I understand why I should be asking questions. Um, and actually, 42 as of yesterday, this morning, if you got up and read the post, number 43 was killed earlier this week. Uh, and I emphasize that especially with my law enforcement brothers and sisters, because what's in it for me? What's in it for you? Going home safe. What's in it for your community? Keeping that community safe. Guns are the weapon of choice uh, for intimate partner homicide perpetrators. I think that's been clearly illustrated here today uh, with the statistics. And, and simply having that, that, that gun there, you know, uh, when, when you read David Adams' work and talking to these perpetrators who, were, who, said, who told him if that gun wasn't there, they would not have carried out the act. You know, about two-thirds of the intimate partner homicides in, in the country, you know, as we, we, we know, are committed by guns. And so that means that, that depth of knowledge by me when I walk through that door should be having a, a working knowledge of the federal statutes, having a working knowledge of the state and local statutes. Because you know what? Even if I can't enforce federal law, I damn well sure can take his contraband, right? 
uh, state and local legislation, uh, in, as you see, in some places really do, do enhance my ability to do my job. But if I'm communicating, if I'm coordinating, if I'm collaborating with my federal partners, with my local partners, with the prosecutor, with everybody else, we can work together as we all should be to get stuff done. And it, it, it's, it's, it's about commitment. You know, when we talked about earlier the, the lethality assessment program that was, that was developed in Maryland, you know, over, over about in the last 10 years, we started in 2006, 2007, average of 69 homicides a year statewide. For the last five years, that number is between 33 to 37, half. And it's because we've been asking questions, we've been getting people to services, getting guns out of individuals' hands, looking at things in context, and really doing what we're supposed to do, and that's ensuring public safety. Thank you. Last, certainly not least, um, is Rob Roberta Valente, who is from the National Domestic Violence Hotline, another person I've worked with for many, many years on this issue. It's a thrill to hear from you today in your position from the National Hotline where you can share um, voices, concerns, desires of survivors as we move forward in this work. Hello everyone and thank you for showing up for this important topic. I see a lot of people in the room that I've been working with for a long time on this topic when there were only about five people in the room. So it's really nice to see this. It's really nice to do this at the Department of Justice, who's always been such a strong partner in this for so many years. So what I'm going to do is, as Darren said, I work for the hotline. We get the calls. They come from all over. We've just crossed the four millionth call mark. Um, we get at, right now we're on target to get around 500,000 calls a year and contacts, um, chats, texts. And what we find is quite a number of these involve firearms. And we're talking, right now I'm going to talk not even about lethality, you've heard about that. And people have talked about um, firearms and coercive control. That's what we hear, because we're talking to the folks who are getting those early warnings, and also the ones who can't get the firearms removed, just as you've heard. And so it's really important that you hear what they're asking. So we filed a brief, an amicus brief, um, in the Voisin case in the U.S. Supreme Court. We try very hard to be part of that with other organizations. And what we really were trying to, we're, we've been trying to educate the court, and I think we've had an impact over any a number of cases in Castleman, Voisin, Heller, all of which are challenges to the laws that you've just heard about. What we keep trying to tell the court is there are limitless ways that abusers use firearms to further co coercive control over their victims. And this is not, we, we worry about this not just to prevent lethality, but it's because we don't want to get these calls, chats, and texts anymore. We want people, we want survivors to be able to live without fear, and without fear of the abuser using a firearm against them. So firearms plus domestic violence equals more severe abuse. That's something that we've learned. It's not just that there are threats. Um, we pulled a 60-day snapshot of callers and chatters issues related to firearms from January 6 to March 6, 2016. And for that two-month window, 836 callers and chatters discussed firearms violence with an advocate. These are people who voluntarily brought it up, and our advocates have little data values that they can click on, and they try to, during the course of the conversation, if they can get there, their first mission is to work with the survivor, but their second is just to keep track of what they're talking about so that we can keep on top of these issues. Um, 836 noted that they discussed firearms. That average is about 14 callers or chatters per day. Those are the ones who talk about it. Um, I want to tell you just one that I heard about. A woman contacted by chat contacted us by chat and said her abuser had so many firearms she'd lost count. And she said he liked carrying them around so much so that he invented and sewed a vest for himself so that he could carry at least 20 around with him at any given time. She lived in a trailer with him down a dirt road. 
There were two cars, but she said she couldn't outdrive him and he could still shoot at her. She was absolutely trapped. And you know, there was not much we could offer her because she called law enforcement. She called local law enforcement. We gave her the ATF number and she said, I called that too. So I just want to leave that there, that we get a lot of callers who tell us just how hard it is to get help. And if what, what Dave just said is so important, we really have to make this a priority for law enforcement to understand that we can prevent something far worse. Imagine that guy walking around now with his 20 firearms in his specially constructed vest. But overall, what we found when we looked at this data was that they also reported a lot more severe abuse than our average chats calls or texts. So when they mentioned firearms, we were also looking at much higher rates of physical, emotional, sexual, and economic abuse. And firearms, I want to reiterate, are not just for killing. They're used to threaten, harass, and ultimately control. We have studies that back this up. It's not just what we hear on the hotline. The Centers for Disease Control, the Intimate Partner Violence Survey, found that approximately 40% of women and men had experienced coercive control in their lifetime. What shape does that take? One of that, another study illuminates. A 2004 study of women in California domestic violence shelters found that of women who had firearms in their home, two-thirds had a partner scare or threaten them with a gun. What does coercive control look like with that? We're going to hear a little bit more, but I'm going to tell you one that the first time an advocate told me this, I just, I've never been able to forget it. A woman contacted us and said, I came home and found a receipt on the kitchen table for the purchase of a firearm. I looked all over the house and I couldn't find it. That's coercive control. Of the women in the California study who said they'd been threatened with a gun, 71% explain, explained their partner had shot at them. Our advocates hear everything. They hear when people are calling while firearms are being used against them, and there is not much that we can do. But when they talk to us, here's what they're, they're telling us. In that 60-day window that I just talked about, 45.3% had children involved. 14.7% had made or had questions about making a police report. 10.8% were being stalked. We know stalking is a, a predictor um, of that. And I'm going to stop now because I run out of time, but you've got the stats right up in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen, and all the information they share. Back to B. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, Darren, for moderating, and, and thank you all panelists for, for being here. And it's, it's, uh, it's been a good conversation, and we might have a little bit of time at the very end, or maybe people can hang out uh, at the end. But um, before we end, um, we're I'm really really thrilled. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've wanted to do is is to make sure that we have information and up to date resources uh, and a and a place to get those resources uh, for both community members and professionals that are addressing issues of domestic violence and firearms. So um, I mentioned earlier that we're launching a website, and so I'm just thrilled to, to uh, invite Christine Lizes, who's the Legal Policy Director for the Battered Women's Justice Project, to talk a little bit about the, the new resource center. The uh, BWJP has uh, taken on this uh, yeoman's task of, of implementing these new resources, working with a number of people here uh, called Safer Families, Safer Communities. So Christine. Yeah, so we've spent quite a bit of time talking about a lot of the challenges that are in front of us as we develop responses to domestic violence related uh, firearm homicide and domestic violence related firearm violence. But one sort of ray of sunshine is we do get to announce the launching of the Safer Families, Safer Communities website, which is at preventdvgunviolence.org as part of a project of the new National Domestic Violence and Firearms Resource Center, which will be managed by the Battered Women's Justice Project with multiple project partners. So this website was developed with the intent to promote efforts by communities to prevent domestic violence related homicides through comprehensive implementation and enforcement of domestic violence related firearm prohibitions at all levels of government. And the project 
that built this website and the combination of partners that built this website really intended to provide communities and promote communities efforts by doing four main functions. So I want to introduce the, some of the functions that this website offers uh, very quickly and I'm hoping people go back and spend more time on the website as we'll only be able to cover it really briefly now. But if we go under the top right navigation tab under resources to community strategies. This is and if, if we go one more down to community, yes, that one, uh, community strategies, close. I could start with community spotlights. <laughs> the, um, the community spotlights is one opportunity to highlight those communities that have taken risks and done really strong work around domestic violence. And for those of us organizations that provide technical assistance to communities around implementation and enforcement of firearm prohibition and what we heard even during these two hours is that a lot of implementation and enforcement barriers are very um, jurisdiction sp uh, specific, very localized and require um, a pretty intensive and detailed type of technical assistance. So communities such as Wisconsin that have already implemented really comprehensive responses are in very good positions to inform the efforts going on in other communities. So in this part of the website, we have the opportunity to highlight those communities that are doing really strong work. And we hope to continue to build this list and provide very detailed overviews and explanations of just how these communities have enhanced their firearm responses and responses to domestic violence related homicide. Now if we go under resources to the second, to community strategies, much of the work that we've done under our technical assistance project, we have focused into four main or five main strategy areas. And this website provides a, a comprehensive step-by-step -step exploration of what those strategies and those five areas of strategies are. We recommend very specific strategies for the civil legal system, for the criminal legal system. When working with the federal government, strategies specifically directed at preventing purchase of firearms and how to better use research and data collection to promote better policies locally. So we can look, if we looked under just the criminal strategies, itself. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, here is where the website offers sort of step by step along the criminal legal process, specific strategies, specific approaches to take at these different areas of the criminal legal response. Throughout this project, we've been collecting information and data uh, forms, protocols, policies, worksheets, specific tools that communities utilize that will be made, that are, are and will be made available by clicking on those individual sites. We also use the community spotlights in the website to highlight just how to implement the specific criminal strategies that are detailed in this website. And then, if we can go back up to, very briefly, to the news section which is uh, to the uh, right, yes, of the resources. This part of the website, we are trying to make sure that communities that are seeking to respond strongly to firearm-related homicide and violence know what the most up-to-date news and relevant policy developments are for their specific communities. And one more section I'll have you go, if you go back to resources and on to the research information and tools. Related, we want to make sure that we are providing communities the state of sort of the state of knowledge regarding what we know in terms of legal system responses and what we know for um, to, tools for advocates and strong advocacy responses as well as what are what's the um, what's the most we know from the research that we have now, and we've been working closely with Dr. Zioli and being able to provide those research summaries to all of us. We have planned website expansion already that we have begun. 
We are intending to have a library of forms, policies, and protocols and resources for communities that really help in the nitty-gritty implementation and enforcement. A lot of the issues that you as audience members have brought up to the panelists and that the panelists address are what's very specific problem solving in this area. We're also intending to provide some interactive tools to allow community members, both advocates and professionals and other interested community members, to use online interactive tools to be able to develop very localized and specific solutions using the five areas of community strategies that are already outlined there. And we are delighted that we will be working with a lot of uh, extremely talented and dedicated experts in the field in what you have seen in, in the website so far and the website build out as well as the new National Domestic Violence and Firearms Resource Center. We have had a close relationship with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. They've been our primary project partner and we're grateful for everything that they've contributed to this website. We've had um, a substantial contribution from the International Association of Chiefs of Police as they've helped us identify our community strategies, what, different communities are doing strong work. And we've also worked closely with Equitas uh, Prosecutors Resource on Violence Against Women in putting together this website. And moving forward, we're excited to announce that we'll also be working with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. We'll be working with um, the National Network to End Domestic Violence and specifically looking at partnerships with womenslaw.org. We'll be working with the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence as an organization that does extremely capable legislative and legal tracking of domestic violence related gun laws. Dr. April Zioli has um, graciously agreed to work with the National Resource Center to help all of us stay as um, on top of uh, the best research out there and what the research means for our interventions and our work. And we're also working as we're developing, um, working with specific communities in the immediate aftermath of firearm related violence, we'll be working with End Domestic Abuse Wisconsin and Safe Horizon and developing these strategies. So we're very excited about the website. We're very excited about the existing and planned build out of this website. We're looking for a lot of feedback on how and why and when this website is useful. We hope that you will visit it often. We hope that you'll sign up for our uh, project newsletter for um, announcements about project updates and um, and again constant feedback on how when why and where this website is most useful to you so thank you very much thank you. it's just so amazing just to see all of the different people and organizations coming together to to create the national domestic violence and and firearms resource center and I hope you know people come and visit it often and and uh, make comments as as they're continuing to to expand it and improve it um, we have a, a couple of minutes. Does anybody have any burning or smoldering questions that they want to ask or comments they want to make? Liberty probably does. <laughs> I want to I want to thank uh, everybody for being here. I also want to give a shout out to Adrenas Hooks over here who helped coordinate this this panel today. So thank you, Adrenas, for taking the lead. I could start on a slippery slope of thanking many other OVW staff, but I'm going to stop that. Um, but I just want to just you know thank all of the OVW staff for who helped put this together, but but also who who are uh, working with us each and every day. I do want to give a shout out to Nadine Newville though, who uh, has really been doing our homicide and firearms uh, stuff, sitting next to Liberty over there. So thanks, Nadine. Um, And thanks again to the to the great panel. Thank you, Darren, for, for putting this all together. And thank all of you uh, for being here today, but most importantly for all of the amazing work that you do in communities all across the country for, for justice and, and for safety for all of us. Thank you.